So welcome to Ribbon College, and thank you for joining us for an evening with Dan Egan, best-selling author of The Devil's Element, Phosphorus and the World Out of Balance. My name is Brian Nell. I'm an assistant professor in the chemistry department here at Ribbon College. And I am Stephanie Prelwitz, CEO and executive director of the Green Lake Association. We are a nonprofit organization that has a singular focus on improving water quality for Green Lake. Um, five miles from here is the deepest natural inland lake uh, in, in Wisconsin, so we're happy to be safeguarding that incredible resource. All right, tonight's event is co-sponsored by Ripon College's Center for Politics and the People, you can see their banners, uh, the Department of Chemistry, the Department of uh, Environmental Studies, along with the Green Lake Association. We're so glad that you were able to join us. Uh, we will try to, we, we will, we won't try. We will leave 15 minutes for questions at the end of our discussion. So with that, we are so pleased to be joined by Dan Egan. Dan Egan is the Bricko Fund Journalist in Residence at the Center for Water Policy at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's School of Freshwater Sciences. He's a New York Times best-selling author, two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, and recipient of numerous awards. He's the author of Death and Life of the Great Lakes, as well as his newest book, and the reason you all are here, uh, The Devil's Element, Phosphorus and a World Out of Balance. So please join us in welcoming Dan Egan. Thank you. Thank you. So Dan, I'm gonna start with a question that I imagine your publisher asked you pretty early on in the project. Um, of out, out of all of the possible topics you could write a book on, why write a book on phosphorus? Yeah, I think he's still asking. <laughs> um, it, was, it was something that I encountered while I was researching the book about the Great Lakes. I did a chapter on Lake Erie, and Lake Erie has suffered mightily over the decades. And uh, we cleaned it up pretty well in the 70s and 80s, and it's slipping backwards, and it's slipping backwards because of phosphorus. And when I wanted to drill down into that, actually at the time, a lot of this work in the Great Lakes book was repurposed material from my two decade plus career at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And when I started looking into phosphorus and I learned how they discovered it and I learned what it had been used for besides fertilizer, I thought, wow, this would be a lot more fun to write than a Great Lakes book. So once I finished the Great Lakes book, they asked if I had any ideas and I said, well, look at that chapter seven, that's just crying to be expanded upon. So, so that's what I did. And it took a little convincing until, it didn't take a lot of convincing. I think I got his attention when I said I wanted to open it up <laughs> with a scene, and I don't want to gross anybody out here, but with the first phosphorus was discovered in the 1600s by an alchemist who cooked it out of urine. And uh, it wasn't just like a mild boiling, it was serious alchemy that took weeks and insanely high heats. And I have a recently deceased father-in-law who was a chemical engineer, and uh, he's this cranky old British guy. And I said, you know, I got a turkey fryer, and uh, I got some beer-drinking friends, and he lived down south. He's like, I'll come up there and we'll give it a go. But then when I was doing some, some research, I, 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 I ran into, uh, I came across a professor at Johns Hopkins University and I reached out to him and he just said, don't. <laughs> it's exceedingly dangerous and it's gross. And so, but it sold the book to the, to the publisher because he was like, okay, you know, you remember it is a book about phosphorus, so we try to keep it interesting. And so I spent the next two years trying to keep it interesting, even without the urine being cooked into phosphorus. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So kind of along those lines, so now we know kind of phosphorus is this really important nutrient for plants and that humans eventually discovered through various means that plants grow better where, you know, we have this decaying matter or, mm -hmm. or feces. Um, and it led to us using manure to supplement fields. So I thought maybe you could speak to um, when in time did this, did this uh, decaying matter not be enough? Whew. Well... I mean, Britain was in, the UK was in a tough spot uh, in the 1800s because, you know, it's, it's an island and they only had so many uh, for crop appropriate fields. And so they were constantly trying to keep those fields from, from being depleted. 
And through trial and error, they'd put whatever they could think of. And you know, it started out with manure, which was a pretty obvious one, human and animal. And then they moved on to bone chips. And um, there's only the, the, the first source of bone chips that they used, and they didn't know what it was about the bone chips, but it was phosphorus. Um, they just knew that it worked. And so uh, they went hunting for bones. And that's when they realized that, you know, we're, this is gonna be a never ending hunt. So they went hunting for bones to grow turnips and wheat and whatnot. And they ended up, you know, one of the places, and I ended up there for the book was Waterloo, because that battle I think was in 1815, and by the mid 1820s, there were no bones on the battlefield. And it wasn't because they'd been removed and treated in some sacred way and planted in the ground. It's because the British went back over and grabbed them all and they built special mills to crush the bones to fertilize their crops. And even then, they didn't know that it was phosphorus. They just knew that it was something in the bones. And they eventually figured out that it was phosphorus during the birth of modern chemistry, really. And so then they, they could look for materials that were really rich in phosphorus and that took took the British and then the rest of the Western world all over the globe on this nonstop hunt. And for the last, if I, am I answering the question or am I just yeah, yeah, dragging Yeah, this is great, this is great. So like the last, the last hundred years, we've relied on these rock deposits, these sedimentary rock deposits, which are relatively scarce, scattered around the globe. But they're, they're basically the, you know, the result of eons, millions of years of dead life raining down on the seafloor and then compacting, turning into sedimentary rock, and then through various forces or sea level change, they become accessible on the surface. And so, you know, we, we started with regular old manure, we moved to bones, then we moved to bird poop. Am I getting, is this a, well, anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. you're well on my so trajectory. We, so we, we went from the battlefield of Waterloo and just battlefields all over Europe, we're running out of bones, and then they went to the Guano Islands off of the coast of uh, Perdu Peru, Peru. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they thought that they had a never ending supply of, of phosphorus rich bird poop when they struck upon these deposits in the 1830s. And uh, as is the case with almost anything, um, we were overly uh, confident that nature would provide, and we ran out of that stuff in about 40 years, which put us on the path to rocks, which is where we are now, and we're in the same spot now, because we're running out of our, thank you, we're running out of our, uh, our rock deposits in the United States, and then after that, we're gonna be dependent on other countries, like we were so long dependent on other countries for fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about um, peak phosphorus then along those, those lines. Um, so in 1938, uh, Franklin Roosevelt called for a national policy on the production and conservation of, of phosphorus. And my understanding is his concern was because if we ran out of phosphorus, there would be such a national and food crisis um, uh, you know, that, 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 um, that it would be a national security issue. Yeah. Um, so nearly a century later, um, the use and extraction of phosphorus is still unregulated. So what's going on there? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know how it's, it's regulated. I don't, I think a lot of it's done on private land, but we don't have a national phosphorus policy. And I actually went to a phosphorus conference. There's hundreds of, of academics who really care about this issue. The public just doesn't because they're unaware of it. But they said at this conference, this is in North Carolina last fall, they said if they had one goal it would be to get a president, a president, any president of the United States to utter the word phosphorus in any context, just to try to get it back on the public's uh, radar screen because it was on in the 1930s and it's off right now. And in the 1930s, we still had, we were lousy with phosphorus. We had a lot of it. Franklin Roosevelt just saw the writing on the wall and now that writing is coming to us, telling us you're headed for trouble. The deposits that we uh, rely on primarily are in Florida, and the estimate is we're good on those for three decades, maybe four decades. And there's some scattered deposits in North Carolina and up in Idaho and Utah, but they're much smaller and lower quality. So then we're gonna be dependent on, on another country or in other countries. But this stuff is, like I said, it's relatively scarce. And 
it's not spread evenly at all around the globe. So it just so happens that uh, Morocco happens to control 70 to 80 percent of the known phosphorus reserves on the planet right now. So think about that. And you know, there's workarounds for oil in, in terms of energy, but there's no workaround for phosphorus. It's in every living cell. I mean, if you have no phosphorus, you have literally no life. And at the same time that we're looking at running out of it in 30 or 40 years, we're overusing it to a horrible effect. You know, you can see it on the lakes and the rivers all over Wisconsin and all over the country and all over the world. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think in your book you mentioned the, the phosphorus paradox, and I think that's kind, that's of, it. kind yeah. of what you're getting at there, so. Yeah, yeah, so we, we are, I mean, it, it, it's crazy. This is, it's, it's just kind of complicated, and that's why the public, they, they, they get climate change and they get, you know, oil scarcity. They don't even know how to spell phosphorus. Neither did I before I started. I put a U in the, oh, I think, yeah, I think I put a U in when I was pitching the book. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we really need to think about, you know, how we're gonna manage the reserves we have less, left, but more importantly, we need to figure out how to manage the phosphorus that we are throwing away. And we're not just throwing it away and it's sitting inert in a landfill, we're throwing it away and it's growing toxic algae making water poisonous, you know, like seriously dangerous to human health. That green goop that you see on the lake surface is, is, can be, you know, not to be overly dramatic, but it can be deadly. It's killed people in Brazil. It's believed to have killed a kid who went swimming in a golf course pond in Dodge County or somewhere around Madison. Uh, back in the, uh, the, the aughts, at some, yeah, I think the aughts. And uh, it's been linked with chronic uh, liver disease and more ominously uh, neurological diseases like ALS. They found clusters of, you know, un abnormally, un extremely high clusters of ALS around lakes in New Hampshire um, in this one study. Uh, these people weren't swimming in the water, they weren't drinking, they were just living near it and it gets aerosolized and you breathe it in and there's no causation established but there is a correlation and there's emerging research that this is really something we need to take seriously. So we gotta feed ourselves and we've gotta drink our water. And right now, the way we're managing our phosphorus, we're headed for trouble in the second half of this century. I think it's interesting that right now you can, if you uh, download an app on your phone in Madison, Wisconsin, um, if you wanna see if there's a blue-green algae bloom at your favorite beach before you go for a swim. You talked about the death of the 17-year-old boy who hopped a fence, went for a swim yeah. in a golf course, um, and suddenly died. Um, yeah, and there was some controversy about that, whether what was the trigger. And I was in Madison this fall for a, a book talk, and the uh, pediatrician, who his pediatrician, um, said, yeah, it was, it was phosphorus. Mm -hmm. it was, that was the culprit. And yeah, and that's wild that they have these apps in Madison, but it's a shame because, you know, if we can't get the Yahara Lakes right, if we can't get Lake Mendota right, where the UW Center for Limnology is, and, you know, we've got the best soil scientists and the best limnologists, which are people who study fresh water, some of them in the world. And, you know, I actually this fall, I went, Trying, because I'm just trying to get people to start thinking about this, and I'll do whatever it takes, almost whatever it takes. Except, except use urine to make phosphorus. Except for what? Except yeah, you. except, yeah. But, but I, um, Charlie Barron's the comedian. <laughs> I, uh, I ran into him on the streets of London. I went, to, right when I finished that book, I went over to, my wife said, get out of the house. So <laughs> literally, I had, with, like, within four days, I bought a ticket to go to London to see the Packers play the Giants, and I ran into Charlie Barron's on the streets of London, and we just started talking, and it turned out he has a passion for water, like fresh water. So we set up a thing uh, at the Union Terrace at the end of August, and we had a good, they said a thousand, but there's always a thousand people on that terrace, you know, drinking beer. <laughs> Although they did cut the beer sales off, which was kind of a disappointment because I wanted to bring in younger people. And um, anyway, uh, he, we, we had a, a, a good group. We had a soil scientist. We had the head of the limnology department. We had Charlie and myself. And we had a talk about how do we get Lake Mendota right? Just as I was saying, if we can't get this lake fixed, 
um, what other lakes do we have hope for? And I remember turning around, it was just this perfectly blue sky day and there's sailboats back and forth and it was right at the beginning of the school year and all the kids are on those uh, metal docks extending out from the terrace and I pointed, I said, you know, those kids should be in the water. They shouldn't be, uh, you know, but there was a no swim advisory because of the blue-green algae and then three, day, three days later, even more kids are on the, one of those docks and it collapsed and uh, that was like, you know, they're in the water but for the wrong reason. But this really is important, you know, the, you talk about that app, you know, for people to know if the water is safe, but it's very important, I think, that you take your kids swimming when the water is good because they need to have that connection with the water because if you lose that, you lose a whole generation that's a constituency for demanding, you know, water be protected. We've been here before and we fixed it back in the 60s when we were polluting the heck out of things and phosphorus was, was a culprit then, back then, Am I, am I getting ahead? Should I pause? No, okay. please. <laughs> Back then, the phosphorus, so Lake Erie was called America's Dead Sea by like 1969. And even Dr. Seuss in the Lorax has a line in the original Lorax, that's important, had a line about how dirty uh, and dreary the water was in Lake Erie. That's and not Schmeary. What, Schmeary, yeah. That, I'm not trying to use his words exactly, but... He, he stung them with a rhyme. And, um, and so, like, people really wanted this fix, not just Lake Erie, but everywhere. And nobody knew why the lakes were turning so green in the 60s and 70s. They knew it was modern pollution, but they didn't know what it was, if it was some chemical excrement, or if it was nitrogen, or if it was carbon, or if it was phosphorus, which all can have a impa significant impact on, on plant growth, aquatic plant growth. And so the Canadians, they have a lot of land, those Canadians, and they have a lot of lakes. So many lakes that they set aside a bunch of them up in far north or far western Ontario um, to do experiments on. And so what they did was they treated these lakes like, like test tubes. And the, the thought at the time was, we can't replicate the way a real lake works with an aquarium. We need to go into the wild just because of the inter interaction between the atmosphere and the water and the way the water turns and the way the nutrients flow. So they set up this remarkably elegant test where they, they took a peanut-shaped lake and right down the, where it was pinched in the middle, they put a, 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 some kind of a plastic curtain that ran from the surface down to the bottom. They secured it with all these boulders along the bottom. And then one side at the time, uh, I got a little ahead of myself. So detergents in the 1960s were largely phosphorus because it really helped clothes get white. And so a lot of people thought phosphorus was the problem at the time and the detergent industry was saying, no, it's carbon, it's nitrogen, it's whatever it is, it's not us. So they, they took a lake and they put nitrogen on one side and phosphorus on the other and simplifying it a little. Well, it was pretty much that simple. And one side got phosphorus and one side didn't and they went up in a helicopter and 10, 14 days later and it was green as a golf course and the other side was blue as the sky. And that really convicted phosphorus and in the court of public opinion, and that's how we got the Clean Water Act, 1972. I mean, it wasn't exclusively that, but that drove it. And that led to basically the elimination of phosphorus and laundry detergent. And so in 1971 or 72, Dr. Seuss wrote the Lorax. By 1985, some researchers at Ohio State University wrote The Good Doctor and said, you need to take that line out of the book, be out of the Lorax, because Lake Erie is not schmeary anymore. And Seuss did. You know, if you go to the bookstore today, you could, you're not gonna find that line in it, but you, you probably should, because Lake Erie's a mess again. And it's still phosphorus, it's not detergent, but now it's coming from overdosing our croplands and most significantly, many people argue, uh, just the manure, just too much, too much animal manure improperly spread and it washes off and the problem with phosphorus is it makes everything grow and that doesn't stop when it hits water it makes bad stuff grow so if we could go back to that Ontario experiment mm -hmm. because you talk about how you know, there's a helicopter ride you've got a peanut shaped lake split in half one is blue the other is bright green and mm -hmm. the one that is bright green is green because of phosphorus and that visual helped drive policy for the Clean Water Act but the Clean Water Act did something 
pretty significant, oh. which is that it distinguished between point sources and non-point sources. Yep. So can you talk a little bit about how did the Clean Water Act help clean up our lakes, um, and, and why did it distinguish yeah. between yeah. point sources and non-point sources? Yeah, when you're writing about this stuff, you hate to say point source and non-point source because you're writing for like a general audience and people's eyes start to glaze over. But what, when we got the Clean Water Act, what they, they decided was they were going to basically plug pipes and cap smokestacks or at least force whatever was coming out of them, whoever was producing what was coming out of them, reduce that dramatically. So that was called point source. They knew where it was coming from, they knew where it hit the lake or the river, and they knew how to stop it. Non-point is what's on the landscape, and that's too diffuse, they thought at the time, to really get your hands on it, and it's also insignificant. So we can solve this problem by just going after point source. So they exempted non-point source, and that effectively exempted agriculture. And that's uh, uh, the legacy of that decision we're stinging from today, because um, farms, we don't farm the way we did in the 1970s anymore. You know, a, a herd of 100 cows used to be significant. And up in Brown County, aptly named Brown County, my hometown, home county, um, They've got farms that have 8,000 heads of ca head of cattle on them. And none of that, the rule of thumb is each cow can produce as much waste as 18 humans. And I'm not gonna be able to do the math here. But one farm can produce as much manure as a significant, like a, a mid-sized city. And none of it's treated. It ends up on the landscape and ideally it grows crops. And this is the really cool thing about phosphorus is it's just, it just doesn't go away. I mean, it, it, it's the problem with it and it's also the promise of it that, you know, you can reuse it over and over and over again. And so we're not doing that, you know, we're just putting it on the landscape, putting manure on the landscape and letting gravity and water call the shots to disastrous effect. So this book is not meant to be a political argument. It's not meant to disparage an industry. I mean, we all need food, but we need water as much as we need food, and we've got to get on a path where we have safe supplies of both, and right now they're, we're working at cross-purposes in that respect. So I think we need to rethink the non-point source pollution exemption, because when you get that much manure from these farms, you know, it's like, there's, they're like pond-sized sewage lagoons. That's a point source of pollution. And it doesn't mean you landfill it, not, a, not at all, but it means you treat it and you process it and you put it in a form that's gonna make it transportable so you can stop mining so much of it down in Florida. That will extend the life of our, of our rock deposits and it'll protect our water too. So it's a win-win and it's not undoable. Um, you know, people, people talk about, you know, the price of food and look at milk. Milk is pretty cheap you know, when you look at the cost over the decades. But that's just what you pay for at the grocery store. There's a price when, you know, hundreds of kids at Madison can't go swimming in the lake that is on, you know, the cover of their, you know, <laughs> alumni magazine. That's a cost, losing a lake to, to, you know, kids being able to swim in it and fish in it and drink from it. So I think we need to talk about how do we get, get our regulations back in line so we can maintain the phosphorus deposits that we have, we extend the phosphorus deposits we have, more wisely use the ones that we're squandering with the manure and protect the water, such as Green Lake. Yeah, I kind of want to go back to uh, the concept of fertilizer. So a lot of people, I think, uh, when they think of fertilizer, they think of nitrogen, mm -hmm. right? But we don't have a supply issue, right, with nitrogen, right? We don't mm -hmm. have... And so you mentioned in your book something, um, you know, with the, the dawn of the chemical fertilizer revolution and the law of limiting factor and in terms of what plants need. I wonder if you could just touch on, like, why is phosphorus so important and why are we, why are we not talking about it if it really is that important? We're not talking about it because people just don't connect, you know, the milk on the shelf in the grocery store with, the, you know, the lake closed for the afternoon on a hot July afternoon and they're definitely connected. Um, so the law of, of uh, the, the limiting factor, basically plant life, modern fertilizer is phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium. And we have plenty of deposits of potassium. 
we used to be pretty scraping for nitrogen. I mean, we were getting a lot of it from manure back in the 1800s. And then back in the early 1900s, uh, Fritz Haber, he's, a, he's, a, he's got the, the, the distinction of being both a, uh, an alleged war criminal and a Nobel Prize winner because <laughs> he figured out how to uh, pull nitrogen out of the air with the Haber-Bosch process. So 70% of the air we breathe is, is nitrogen, but it wasn't accessible. Most of it's not accessible to plants. There's certain legumes, like peas and beans, they, they will pull nitrogen out of the out of the atmosphere and put it in the soil so it can be used. But Haber and Bosch figured out how to do this on a factory scale. He also figured out how to use gas to kill people in the trenches during World War One. That's why he's charged as a war criminal. But so we have to we have deposits of potassium. We have unlimited basically supplies of nitrogen, but the limiting factor, it's like, uh, I think I say in the book, I mean, it's so much common sense, it just becomes hard to explain, but the limiting factor is the one thing that you need that is limiting growth. And I think in the book, I use a ham and cheese sandwich. It's like, if you've got eight pieces of bread and eight pieces of ham and eight pieces of cheese, say 16 pieces of bread, you can make eight, san eight ham sandwiches. But if you only have one piece of cheese, you're only gonna make one ham and cheese sandwich and phosphorus is the cheese. And, and so that is the limiting factor in freshwater ecosystems from keeping, er, from that when you add phosphorus, you basically add algae. And increasingly this algae is becoming toxic. And that's complicated by invasive mussels. And we don't need to do a biology lesson here, but they're related. I mean, they, well, I'll just say, so, <laughs> So the mussels that, do you have them in Green Lake? We have zebra mussels. Yeah, so what they do is they filter, they don't have brains, but they're smart enough, they filter feed, they'll, they'll eat everything floating in the water column, but they'll spit out this blue-green algae. So when you have conditions primed for an algae outbreak, in the past it would be an assemblage of some healthy algae, you know, some, this makes up the bottom of the food chain. But because today the mussels have so altered the equation in the lakes, when you get an algae outbreak, like in Lake Erie, it's more likely to be toxic because the mussels don't eat that and, the, and that algae has no competition because the mussels have eaten everything else. So that's the limiting factor that, you know, you put phosphorus in a lake and boom, you're gonna get an algae explosion and too often it's gonna be toxic. You were talking about, we've talked about phosphorus as fertilizer, um, phosphate, soap, uh, but before that, phosphorus has been used for some pretty nefarious uh, reasons. Yeah. Can you talk about kind of the, the history of, of phosphorus and how, especially sure. in World War II, um, what happened there? Yeah, so I went to Hamburg for this book because the, the guy who cooked the phosphorus out of urine was based there. It's, his name was Hennig Brandt, and he did it in 1679. And he was looking for the Philosopher's Stone, which was this mythical substance that they believed back in the 1500s and 1600s could transfer, transmute uh, base metals into gold or silver. Their thinking along the, at the time was all these metals are just slowly evolving into you know, something precious, platinum or gold, whatever. We need to figure out what that is and speed that process along. And so Brand thought he could derive it from the human waste stream and he cooked it out of his urine. It wasn't just his urine, I mean, it, he had vats of it. And uh, he ended up with these, these little wax-like nuggets that glowed in the dark, phosphorescent. And it was just kind of like a curiosity for the first 50 or 60 years that they had it. But then they started figuring out how combustible it was. Because the thing about this stuff, elemental phosphorus, it doesn't exist in the natural world. Phosphorus is always bound up with oxygen atoms to create phosphates, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about fertilizer. But if you get the phosphorus isolated and you warm it above a tick, tick above room temperature, maybe 80 Fahrenheit, it, ex it combusts and it'll, it burns and it burns hot. So we soon figured out how to use it for matchmaking, making matches, not putting people together. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and weapons. And so Hamburg was an interesting place to go for this book because that's where it was discovered. And then in 1943, the Allies leveled that city, basically burned it to the ground with uh, firebombs, and many of them were phosphorus. So phosphorus hometown uh, got burned down by the stuff. 
And the uh, tragedy of that exists today in the form of people on the Baltic coast or along the Elbe River. The place is famous for uh, amber because it used to be a, millions of years ago, it was a pine forest and that resin is, you know, turned into amber over, amber over the time and it's valuable. These phosphorus nuggets that were in these bombs are the same size as an, as an amber nugget and they look the same. So people are actively looking for it. And I found a couple of people, like I talked to, there's a guy in the opening of the book, he was walking on the shore of the uh, Baltic coasts looking, looking for whatever the sea was kicking up, whatever kind of precious nuggets he could find. And he thought that he had found, he thought it was an oyster shell, like a fossilized oyster shell, it was kind of orange put it in his pocket and his pants exploded and he had to run into the sea and uh, to put it out and then he'd step out and it would flare up again and there was just one fisherman on the beach and he's screaming for help and uh, they were gonna bring in a helicopter but they thought he might take down the helicopter. They had no idea what was going on. An ambulance came and packed him in wet towels and he survived but he had burns on like 40% of his body. And so that's Hamburg. You know, it's where it was discovered, it was burned to the ground. And then today, I was talking earlier about being better at reusing phosphorus. Hamburg has the state-of-the-art phosphorus recovery plant at its water treat, water, wastewater treatment plant. And they're shooting to, by the end of the decade to, to pull, you can never get to zero, but to get as close to zero as possible, the phosphorus coming out of their, their wastewater. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's really fascinating to think about how this stuff just doesn't go away, and that, that's great when you're growing crops. It's not when you're growing algae in lakes or picking up fossils on a beach. Kind of along those lines of the, the recovery of phosphorus, is that something the United States is moving toward? No. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, we've gotten better at pulling it from wastewater treatment plants, and humans are a pretty big source of it, but it pales compared to livestock. It just does, and it's, you know, this is anathema in dairy land, but it's gotta be talked about because what's also anathema are just lakes that you can't use, so. You talk about we have wastewater treatment facilities for humans. Human waste, yeah. We can do it for cows, you know, you can, and the thing is, is as a rule of thumb, a farmer can't really transport this manure that they produce more than 10 miles. I mean, it varies depending on where you are, but that's the, the rule of thumb. You move it more than 10 miles, you're losing a lot of money. And that's, you know, it's very inefficient because it gets liquefied, so you're moving a lot of water. But you can pelletize the, the phosphorus in there, the phosphates, it wouldn't explode. But, and, and now you've got these, just like you go to a co-op and buy farm fertilizer, you, you would get, it would, it's the exact same stuff, chemically speaking. And, you know, it's, it's valuable. That's, that's the thing that, you know, we've just got to stop looking at it as a waste. It's, it's the opposite. It's, it's food. It's our future. And the, you know, people in England intuited that. And, and so have been, people have since antiquity. Um, but we haven't. <laughs> we've lost that. So we got to get that back. You talk a little bit about how, you know, that the profit margins on the family farm are thinner, or, you know, razor thin. Mm -hmm. um, dairy farms are closing every day, uh, but yet we're all in the habit of going to the grocery store and buying, you know, it, it, sometimes it seems like flavored water is probably more expensive than a, than a gallon of milk. So what are some of the decisions that we can make as individuals? I think when you read this book, you know, we have the power of the purse. What are some of the individual choices that we all can make to support kind of clean, clean lakes? Well, I come from the journalism side of things. So I, like I, in this book, I say in it, you know, it's not meant to be prescriptive. And I kind of, and this isn't a cop out, I think it's, it's important to approach the job like this. I'm just trying to connect dots, to paint a picture, to let people see it, and then they can figure out what to do with it. I'm not saying we need to do, you know, incorporate this technology and do it by 2035. And that's, that's beyond me and it's inappropriate, I think, for me to become that much of an advocate. I think the most important thing you can do, it's deceptively simple, but one, make sure your kids swim when the water's clean. And, and two, let people, if, read the book. <laughs> that's what, yeah. I mean, 
just if you get educated about it, talk to people about it. And, you know, it's going to bubble up. It, it's inevitable. I mean, once you get attuned to this, you start, especially if you, like, use Twitter and you have, like, a phosphoria as one of your, you know, feeds. Uh, there's stories in the summer, whether you're in the southern hemisphere, it's going on now, or northern hemisphere, it's coming. During, during the, the hot season, there's stories every day about lakes that are unusable. And it goes beyond lakes. So we were talking about the limiting factor. Phosphorus is the limiting factor in fresh water, and nitrogen is the limiting factor in salt water, typically. Um, with the climate change going on that we have, we had the wettest 12-month period in, I think, 2019, 2018 to 2019. It was a 12-month period. It wasn't a calendar year, but it was in the, uh, uh, the, the Mississippi River Basin, which spans across 40% of the continental United States, well, 1.2 million square miles or something like that. It's huge. And it all comes out at Missis or down at New Orleans. And uh, some of it gets shunted when the water's high. And in, the, in 20, 2019, some went through Lake Pontchartrain out to the, into the Mississippi, or in, into the Gulf along the Mississippi coast. And there was so much fresh water along the coast that summer that it could sustain this, this toxic algae that is typically a freshwater scourge, microcystis. To the point that 40 miles of beach, 27 public beaches were closed for swimming for the whole summer. And these guys, I talked to this guy who bought like two dozen jet skis to rent in Biloxi, Mississippi. And it was just after the 4th of July weekend and they had put the signs up, no swimming at the end of June. And it was like Jaws, you know, it just ruined tourism. And there were a lot of people who thought, we can't close the beach, but the scientists were saying, this is, this is dangerous. And I was talking to this guy and he's like, I'm being regulated out of business. And the problem is starting up in Iowa and beyond. It's like, why aren't they being regu regulated adequately? Why does it fall on me? Because he ended up taking those jet skis to someplace in Georgia and had a fire sale to pay the bank. And so, yeah, and that gets, that, you know, it's connecting dots. So Iowa is big corn growing. So this is another thing you can do is get educated about ethanol and whether it's actually a benefit or not. I don't think it's a benefit. I think that you know the energy input it takes to, and this isn't a radical thought. This is what all the science says, except for it's, the politicians feel differently because if you want to be president of the United States, you have to do well in Iowa. Typically, historically, now that the Democrats have moved the primary calendar, you know, so Iowa isn't at the front. But historically, if you want to do well in Iowa, or do you want to be president, you have to do well in Iowa. And if you want to do well in Iowa, you have to pledge allegiance to ethanol, and everybody does it. Every, Al Gore did it. And, you know, so we've turned 16 million acres of, of wild land into crop lands, an additional 16 million acres since the mid 90s, just to grow corn, to make ethanol, to put in our cars. And so for, this is stunning, but like 40% of the corn we grow in the United States ends up in our tanks. All right, so here at Urban College, we're, we're a liberal arts institution. Mm -hmm. um, you have your history degree, uh, which is not uh, necessarily journalism, no. per se, but, and you've worked for newspapers like the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for several years, you worked out west for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and then you ended up writing a, a, a book about, sci a science-y book about water uh, quality issues. So with, I, I have a bunch of my students here, as well as others. Um, how has it been an asset to you as being a, a non-scientist but writing about scientific issues? First of all, it's not a sciencey book. <laughs> it's a book. <laughs> happens to talk about science. No, um, I don't have any formal training in, in the sciences. Um, but being, being a history major, I didn't realize it at the time. I thought of it as kind of the path of least resistance because I was going to be an English major, but that seemed like more work. <laughs> So, but history was just reading and writing, and I didn't really realize that it was sticking with me until I started working on these books. And I found myself like sometimes spending two weeks, three weeks on something that I know is never gonna make it into the book, but I just go down a rabbit hole. And um, I thought, I think that that broad education that I had, it's really, it's, it's, it's hard to even talk about because you can't articulate what it, what it means to be to be able to synthesize things, I mean, until you're doing it. 
And I know I couldn't do this out of high, couldn't have done this if I went right out of high school at all. But I also couldn't walk into somewhere and say, hire me, I have a, a history degree. You know, it's, it's really tricky, but boy, yeah, I've got four kids, two in high school, two in college. One's an English and art history major, one's a geology and classics major. The other one's gonna be an engineer, and I don't know about the other one, but uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to get her out of high school. Um, <laughs> it's, I, it's invaluable, but it's, a, it's kind of a luxury too. I mean, you gotta be honest because the payoff doesn't come right away, you know? It's, it, it, it comes throughout, it just keeps paying off throughout your life, really. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big thinker about this stuff, but I do, I do really value the education that I got in terms of a broad liberal arts. Um, maybe one more question here uh, before we open the floor up for questions. Um, your, your publisher once said that it's a book about phosphorus, so don't make it too long. Yeah. I'm wondering if there were any stories that you really wanted to include um, uh, or couldn't when you were writing the book. Well, I was going to go places. Like, I was going to go to Guam where all these people got ALS-like diseases from consuming this protein that's in this... It is a sciencey book, isn't it? <laughs> in, in this algae. And I wanted to go to the Guano Islands. And I mean, I, I didn't want to go. I was going. I was lining up, you know, people to help me out, fixers, as they call them. Um, and I was dabbling with the idea of going to Western Sahara, but that's a pretty sketchy place. And, uh, but it was gonna be, a lot of these places that I write about, I was gonna be there. And once the COVID re travel restri restrictions lifted, I started talking to the editor, and I had written some of this as placeholder material, really literally to like hold it until I could go to that place. And um, he said, look, this is about the right length for the general public, so let's, let's leave it at that. So that's, I really would have loved to have make, made my own phosphorus. And we're actually talking about maybe doing a, a, a show with the CBC up in Canada. I don't know what's gonna cover that, but I'll try again. If you get a camera and stuff, um, you know, I'll use more than the turkey fryer. But, uh, yeah. uh, don't, don't invite us to Thanksgiving yeah, that year. <laughs> Well, with that, I think we'd like to open the, the floor up for, for questions. Um. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if you could tell us about anything that gives you, like if you've seen any um, sort of technological fix or what they're doing in, was it Germany, I guess, where they're pulling phosphorus out of the water, doing a really good job. Is there anything that you see there that looks like it might be scalable in a broader range of situations, like pulling it out of Green Lake? Pulling it out of a lake, I, I don't know about that. I mean, that's one of the tricky things because when we're talking about phosphorus in the 1960s, we knew the source, we stopped, it, we stopped it, and the lake healed itself. With phosphorus, it's just been going on for, for more than a century now, and it's, it's accumulated in the sediments of the lake, and Lake Erie is really shallow. So when, when it gets stirred up, the lake bed, the phosphorus gets stirred up, and so that's, you know, they talk about lakes, residency times, and that means, you know, how long it takes a, a drop of water to flow into a lake and out of a lake. And basically, how long does it take till you get a whole new lake in terms of the water that's in it? In Lake Erie, it's 2.7 years. So we've got that going for us, but I have no idea what Green Lake is, but like Lake Superior is 200 years. I think like Michigan's 100 years. So it doesn't mean that if we stop the flow of phosphorus into the lake, we're not gonna see an improvement, we are but there's gonna be this legacy phosphorus in both the sediments and the soils that we're gonna to have to deal with for a while. And so it's kind of a hard sell, but it's like, you know, it's, it's like, you gotta try. It's like if you, you know, the first thing, if you've got lung cancer, you probably should stop smoking. That's the first step. And, and that's, what we, that's what we need to do, stop, stop putting it into the system. But as far as, I mean, I've heard people talking about dredging dredging Western Lake Erie. And you know, I could see it coming to that down the road when we're not getting the phosphorus we want from other countries at you know, prices we want. We'll, we'll start mining the stuff that we've squandered. As far as other people scaling this up for other cities, what's going on in Hamburg, it's, it's happening. It's not e European Union wide, but I, I think many countries are on the same track and they're trying to do both things. They're trying to solve the paradox. They're trying to protect their water and they're trying to provide fertilizer for their farmers because Western Europe, Europe basically 
doesn't have phosphorus deposits or very low quality at this point. So they're, they're dependent on other countries and they want to wean that dependence. And it looks like what they're doing is working. I mean, I saw, when I saw it, it was a pilot program back in 2019, but they've built it and it was supposed to go operational in November or December and I haven't heard any accounts that it's not, it's not working. You know, I think it's working well. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am a farmer and a soil scientist. Um, and <laughs> I should have talked to you three years ago. <laughs> um, so, and I actually just spent the whole day with farmers talking about phosphorus, um, or just a, a one town over from here. Uh -huh. um, and uh, what, one thing that we're, we're finding is that when you put, uh, we, you know, a lot of farmers have switched to lower tillage systems in order to reduce erosion, which has really done a lot. Um, but we're actually finding that, unfortunately, um, we, we're not able to stem the flow of phosphorus even with, with lowering our amount of tillage. And, and, um, and, and we're, we're, we're trying, trust me. Yeah. And so um, I'm wondering if you have seen any, any technologies or what you would propose um, in, in terms of what you've seen out there in, in, your, in your work, because we, at this, at this point, <clears throat> even if you were to pelletize it, mm -hmm you'd still be spreading it on the field, especially if we're not using a tillage system. So if we're gonna spread it on the field, it's still gonna be there. And if we have a runoff event, which even if we're not having erosion, we're somehow still losing phosphorus off the fields. So I'm just wondering, what, yeah, what is it that gives you hope? Could you be a little more yeah, elaborate? Yeah, okay, more? So, so I think the reducing or going to no tillage you know, it's great for sediment, but it's not great for phosphorus because you know, it gets applied. We, I, you know, I've, I've never been in a combine, but you know, it typically gets applied in the fall when the fields are hard and you get the machinery out there. And then if you have a wet spring, all the stuff that's been applied over the, before the winter gets flushed off before the crops can take it up. So the tillage, that's a tricky thing. You know, it, it, it does, it, uh, reducing tillage reduces sediment, but it doesn't necessarily reduce the phosphorus. I don't, I'm not a soil scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but I think what's happened is for, for decades, phosphorus was over applied because it was, it was just like any medicine, a little's good, more, more is better. And I talked to a lot of people who said that was the message that was coming out of the land grants and <clears throat> from the extension agents and whatnot. You can get into phosphorus balance I mean, and that's really the goal, but you're not, every year you're not gonna be in it, depending on what happens with the weather. We have 300 million people to feed, and that's an undeniable fact. So we have to get used to the fact that there is gonna be years when we're out of balance, but there can be years where we're, we are in balance, and that's what we have to strive for. And I think more importantly, the lower hanging fruit here is the, is the ethanol. It's, it's raising so much corn for a product of dubious, value. And that's something that can be debated. I'm sure we could sit around and talk about that. But, um, you know, most of the farmers, there was a study that came out at Ohio State University back in like 2014 or 2015. Most farmers said, it's a problem, phosphorus runoff, but it's, it's not me. You know, I, I'm doing everything I can. And I think most, they are, but I think they need more help, they need more money, and they need the public to, you know, support them. And if, you, if these regulations are applied uniformly, milk's gonna go up in price, but it's gonna go up for everybody. And, and just like the, pho the phosphate issue in the 1960s, when you know, Procter & Gamble was saying, they were literally saying we, we, we were in danger of slipping into pestilence if we abandoned this modern detergent that was driven by phosphorus. And that wasn't the case. You know, my shirt isn't as white as it should, would be in 1967, but it's white enough, I hope. <laughs> but I do, I wanna say again, like I don't wanna just, like the farmers, they're, they're not getting rich. Then they, they know the land and care about the land more than anybody. We're just in a system right now that isn't working. It isn't working well for them and it's not working well for the lakes, which means it's not working well for the general public. If I'm running for office on the platform that we need to have less green lawns and less green putting greens so that we can have cleaner lakes and a better environment in general, will I get elected? Yeah, probably not. But I mean, the, the lawns and the putting greens and the golf courses are a factor, but they're not, they're not as significant as, as some of the others. But yeah, we want humans, Americans, they want a lot. 
You know, they, they want golf courses, they want steak, they want milkshakes, and they want to take them to a beach where they can swim. And we can get there. I mean, I don't think that it's, you know, they're, they're mutually exclusive. We just need leadership. And that, that comes from people demanding that. And how you get there, I don't know. Evening, thank you for your time. Uh, my question is, I'm chapter chairman for Walleyes for tomorrow on Big Green Lake, so I'm out there in mid-April and see one hell of an ugly algae bloom. I think another issue we have with the algae is we know it settles on the weeds, settles on the bottom, and then middle of the summer when the lake is nice and warm, we have those bow up wakeboarding boats that go out there and just churn mm -hmm. the hell out of everything. And it's been proven that they can be very detrimental to 20 feet of water when they go bow forward. What is your feeling on that? I mean, it just seems to me that it's remixing everything. I've seen it so shredded this past summer out there from that activity. It's well, that's, that's one area where you can take action, you know, lake owners associations and, and set up rules and, you know, no wake zones and, and whatnot. But that's on, a, that's on a, a, a pretty small scale to what we're talking about at the moment. But it's real, you know. I'm old enough to have seen every 60 Minutes uh, documentary about the Guano Islands. So oh. can you give us some updates on what's, what's this going on there? Well, those islands, so those islands were really, uh, are really unique. It's basically, it's as dry of a desert as you'll find anywhere off the coast of Peru. And uh, these islands are in the middle of a migratory route. So the, the fish come up. Uh, along the western coast of South America, and the birds eat the fish, and the birds need a place to nest, and so they they go to these islands, and they not, not only nest, they poop, and because it never rains, these nutrients don't get washed into the, the Pacific, they just accrete over thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years probably. So they had mountains. You can see pictures, you know, just on Google searches. There were literally mountains of desiccated bird poop that was rich with phosphorus, it also had nitrogen and potassium. It was like a store-bought, co-op bought fertilizer. And we, 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 being the US and Western Europe, stripped those islands down significantly. It's coming back because the birds are, the fish are still there, the birds are still pooping. And there is some guano harvest going on, but it's on a very sustainable, regulated way. The, you know, the, the indigenous people, when the Sp Spaniards arrived, they came across, you know, these just remarkably rich fields and they dug into it a little bit and they learned that people could be killed for, for going out and messing with the islands because it was messing with their agriculture, which meant it, mess, it was messing with their future. So we don't, we, there is, I think the marijuana uh, industry likes guano because it's organic and everything like that. So. There is limited harvests going on, but it's, from what I understand, being done on a sustainable way. But the, the big mountains are gone. We, we took them. Is the problem solely demand, or is it also supply? That is, unless we're dealing with a closed loop system, additional phosphorus has to come from somewhere. Someone has to mine it, someone has to produce it, to promote it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's a point of leverage or a point of resistance. Well, you know, like I was saying earlier, it's not just, you know, we're, we're gonna need to add phosphorus, but we also need to reuse it. It's just like a water molecule. It just doesn't go away. So I guess I'm not totally clear on, on the question as far as, you're talking about regulating the phosphorus, phosphate mining industry? Well, there's a whole chain here. The phosphorus doesn't magically appear. Yeah. Farmers have to demand it. Um, suppliers have to promote its use. And of course, they have a supply chain behind them. And you mentioned the agricultural extension services, which in the past promoted the use of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me there are a number of points of where you could apply leverage, some pressure. Or, yeah. Leverage or in turn of resistance to change. Well, I'm sure there's resistance to change on the on the industrial scale of things. But 
I mean, the farmers want to, it's getting, you know, you know what's going to bring this to the public's consciousness is another fertilizer shortage like we had in 2008 when there were food riots all around the world. And, you know, it was driven by, by a spike in fertilizer prices. And I don't remember what, what triggered that, but it, it, it was scary. And, um, yeah, I think there are pressure points there that can be applied. And the farmers, again, the stuff's expensive. It used to be relatively cheap. It's expensive, and it's probably going to get more expensive. They don't want to over-apply it anymore. It just comes down to manure and to, and to corn, I think. So you talked about climate change a little bit and, like, um, kind of about like, so you're, we're targeting the phosphorus problem, but would it be more kind of detrimental to it if we just attack climate change as itself? Because I'm assuming that all these runoffs and stuff are going to be detrimental because our rising heat, our rising temperatures are going to be causing these algae blooms. So I'm curious as to why we're attacking the phosphorus problem itself rather than attacking the climate change problem as well. Well, they're related. Yeah, I think we can do more to reverse the phosphorus situation in our time scale than we can with climate. And what we do for climate is, is only going to help with the phosphorus issue. But the algae is, the studies show that as the lakes warm and as more carbon goes into the atmosphere, the carbon, the, the, the algae love warm water and they feast on the additional carbon. So what's bad in terms of climate change is also bad in terms of algae and phosphorus drive, driving it. I think we got time for, Derek, you, you can ask your question. Okay. We, got, we got two more questions. Okay, so um, regarding the whole like point sources of phosphorus thing, you mentioned that for, um, manure isn't regulated, but I mean, sorry, uh, like uh, the, those large factory farms that you see about in all the news, they produce it on a mass scale that like, I don't think any one dairy farmer, because I know a few dairy farmers, they don't have that much. So could those possibly be like targeted as point sources if? Well, I think they are point sources now. I mean, just not legally, but practically speaking. They, they are, um, and I don't know what size farms you're, you're talking about, but and, you know, the way the Clean Water Act works, it's the, it, like barn areas are regulated, but once it, goes, once it, go, once it leaves the barn the, the, and goes onto the field, it bureaucratically becomes non-point, therefore largely unregulated. But you look at like in the Fox River up by Green Bay, They've got watersheds that are, you know, they've got a target to fix the problem with the algae growth in the Fox River and in Green Bay. But they have watersheds that are 30, 40 times producing, discharging 30 to 40 times what, what the science says these watersheds can handle. And it's, you know, I was driving along the Fox River this fall. It was well after the summer season and the Fox River up by St. Norbert College on the eastern shore, the eastern bank, was just, just yeah, green. Green as paint. So uh, you mentioned that um, mostly phosphorus is like triggering growth of the toxic algae and whatnot, and I was wondering if uh, it's having any effect. Obviously, it's toxic to humans, what effect it might be having on aquatic life, such as like fish and turtles and amphibians? Yeah, it does, it does have an effect. And one of the more interesting studies that I saw was a number of studies, but uh, these beaches in Mississippi and Florida has a similar problem with, with toxic algae coming from Lake Okeechobee to the two coasts and uh, the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. And they've had like these unusual mortality incidents with, uh, with dolphins. And they've done uh, brain analyses. And they have all this protein that work the same BMAA. I don't know what it stands for. But it's the same protein that was triggering these ALS-like breakout in Guam, 
And they got it from eating bats because the bats ate these seeds that also had the BMAA. But if it's in the water, it's gonna get in the fish. What it means for the sports fishery, I'm not sure. Lake Erie is still going pretty strong, but those guys are putting themselves at risk having to push through four or five miles of just algae slick to get out into the open water. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Dan, thank you so much for taking this, the time tonight. If we could give a round of applause, please. Thanks.